computer now. Okay. Um, you all are already using the next thing we like to have people use their full name and their identification, but everybody has already done that. Um, I ask you to stay muted during the presentations, if you would. Um, and I will be taking questions uh, at our two segments uh, after our, each of our two segments. Uh, and I think uh, that will, that's about it. I'm going to uh, ask uh, Jennifer, if she would, to open the meeting with our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Tony, and welcome all. Um, many of you may know that we are living and working on the lands of the Pequasset Band of the Massachusetts oh, wow. Tribe. And Happy birthday! Oh. <laughs> Happy people, birthday to people. you! Happy birthday! Sharon, Sharon you're, you're, you need to mute. People mute, please. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll go back to our land acknowledgement where um, I think to me, the importance of doing a land acknowledgement is to realize that indigenous people lived here on these lands for thousands of years before the European settlers arrived on the lands. And I'm a member of the Pigs Gusset Initiative, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. And one of the main focuses of our work is to address the erasure of indigenous people, both um, through our history and also um, in our present. And any of you who have looked at the town seal, see one of the false narratives that's portrayed everywhere in Watertown. So I will encourage all of you to continue to learn more about the indigenous people of these lands and how they've brought us to where we are now and that they are still part of our community and that we need to find ways to include them and their culture and their history um, in our day to day. So thank you and welcome to the land of the Pequasset Band of the Massachusetts Tribe. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Um, just today, we're up to 30 participants, just so you know. It would be nice if, again, to those people, if you would pull your, put your full name into your, rep, uh, uh, into the area where you put your name. Um, and I'm going to, just to be, I'm having trouble with my, um, hmm. My Zoom. So if you see me go off, I still see everybody and I still will manage the meeting. But I just want you to know that I may go off and on uh, like right now. Now, we're, uh, the next part of our program is brief presentations by our working group. Uh, and I think we'll start off with Deborah, who's going to be doing water. Can people mute, please? Watertown. Um, faces climate change. Uh, Deb, how you doing? Uh, so Watertown faces climate change. We're still meeting every two weeks because there's so much going on. Um, we've been we've been spending a lot of uh, effort looking at the comprehensive the draft comprehensive plan, which many of you uh, have also probably uh, been looking at. And we've been looking at it from the point of view of how does this move forward our climate and energy plan. And we're feeling that it's um, it's thin. It doesn't really make a connection from their recommendations to, uh, to our climate goals. It doesn't embed the rec recommendations in the climate goals. So you don't sort of understand how the recommendations fit in. And it's kind of timid. It's, uh, you know, we recommend that you look at or consider instead of really giving a template or um, a guidance of what to actually do. So we've been active, like formulating a statement on that and figuring out the best way to move forward. Um, since we're part of 350, we've also been paying attention to 350 Mass's legislative agenda. They look at the beginning of the <clears throat> uh, legislative session, which bills they're going to really focus on and have identified six and are asking us all to, to be very active in promoting them. One of those bills is a bill called um, Make Polluters Pay. And it's a bill that our own Steve Owens has um, uh, whatever initiated, and there's going to be a uh, 
uh, sort of kickoff for that bill here in Watertown at the Commander's Mansion on Friday at 10 a.m. I want to encourage you all to, to come learn more about the bill and um, support uh, Steve Owens. So I'm going to put in the chat how to find out more about that. Thank um, you. And then the other thing is actions. And in on March 22nd, there's going to be action against the banks, um, protesting in front of banks that are uh, doing a lot of funding for uh, fossil fuels. So um, I think we're going to be participating at a Chase Bank, I think in Newton, but uh, sort of stay tuned and can come and join us. Thank you, Deborah. Arun, could you do Watertown Community for Black Lives, please? Thank you. Watertown Community for Black Lives is um, changing to a quarterly schedule because we are having trouble with um, organizing meetings. But otherwise, we are active in both the choosing of a police chief and the new police chief and in the schools. And um, we meet on April 3rd. So if you're interested in joining us, please look at the WCBJE website. And I guess that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Arun. Uh, uh, Jackie, could you do the refugee support group, please? Sure, thanks. Um, well, Mary, who is presenting tonight, is part of our refugee support group. So I'm going to make it very quick what we're up to besides what Mary's been working on. Um, we support individual families, individual people. Um, financially, we help take them to appointments. And so we continue doing that. Um, we've also, uh, Diane Crowley, one of our members has been, um, if you looked at the, our, the website, um, has posted things about uh, donating to Turkey and Syria. And um, we will have already sent a bunch of stuff up to um, New Syria, uh, help for Syria. Um, they're up in, I think, New Hampshire. And um, we also, uh, on May 6th from 11, no, did I get that right? Um, we're going to uh, she's we're going to do a uh, on March 27th there's going to be a um, a benefit a fundraiser to raise money for doctors without borders to go to Syria and Turkey and we're going to be doing um massage with and reiki um and it's going to I I forget where we're I think we're doing it at the uh, First Parish Church and uh, there'll be more about that so people can sign up for sessions. There'll be 15 minute sessions. Um, and she's also working on, um, so I think that's the main thing that she's working on. Also um, on May 6th um, from 11.30 to two, I believe it's in the library. Um, Ann Beniquist, one of our members is wor working with, um, um, with uh, what's it? project literacy, and they're going to have immigrant stories. So that's something that I hope you all come to and to hear some of our the people that uh, our work that get that we work with um, that they're going to be telling their stories. So um, I think that's was that okay. so that's basically what we're doing. Thank you. All right, Jane, do you want to quickly do the peace and common security? I got to unmute, Jean. There you go. So many complications here. Um, we have been focused on the war in Ukraine. Uh, we have a weekly standout most of the time. At the Delta. This coming Sunday, we will be there from four to five in the afternoon. Um, 
making space for a webinar from 2 to 3.30 about the 20th anniversary of the United States' invasion of Iraq. We have finished reading a book about the war in Ukraine by Medea Benjamin of Code Pink. We read it and discussed it in our meetings. And we have monthly meetings on the second Sunday of the month. So the next meeting would be on April 9th at seven in the evening on Zoom. And all are invited to attend those. Thank you. Uh, again, the, meet, the meeting link would be on the uh, Watertown Citizens website. Great. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Pam, you want to do Friends of Bees? Pam? So, um, as you know, uh, Friends of Bees and Watertown Community Gardens have been uh, planting and maintaining uh, pollinator gardens in Watertown. And we have several events coming up in April and May. If you go to the watertowngardens.org website, you can see uh, several events we have lined up for people to help do maintenance. Also, our next Friends of Bees meeting on March 29th will be a special presentation about uh, planting your health strip for pollinators. And that will be followed on um, the next Sunday, April 2nd, by the first pollinator garden event where we will actually go to a garden in the West End and get it, prep it for planting for pollinators. And uh, Friends of Bees is also going to be participating in yard art. Um, if you've ever seen our logo, you've seen Sharon Bauer's artwork with her advice. We have booked Turtle Studios, and we're going to be making at least two banners um, that I know of. And you don't have to actually have a project to work on. Anyone's welcome to come help us paint. And it's going to be this Sunday between 1 to 5. And I put the Friends of Peace email in the uh, chat if you're interested in um, joining us. We have room for a few more people to, uh, to play. And I think that's it for now. Thank you, Pam. And finally, Jennifer, would you do the Pig Quasset Initiative, please? Pig Quasset Initiative. Pig Quasset. Pig Quasset. Thank you. Sorry. I know that for people who are not familiar with that word, everybody's like, that is such a weird word. And it's actually the um, British colonizers take on the name for this area that the native people were using. And it sort of represents the widening of the meadows by the river. So that's sort of what pig's gusset stands for is sort of a um, not correct term, but our group took it on as Pig's Gusset Initiative. And as I mentioned earlier, we're um, interested in addressing the erasure of indigenous peoples, um, both past and present. And right now we have two main projects that we're working on that I'd like to invite all of you to join in. Um, so um, May 11th, Thursday, May 11th from 6.30 to eight, listen to Sipu, the historical play created by um, Mualim, Peters um, with the new rep, new repertory theater um, is being presented at uh, Watertown Middle School from 6.30 to eight. And this is a historical play from the indigenous perspective of the for arrival of the European settlers here in this area that we now call Watertown. So that will be open to the public. We have funding from both the Watertown Cultural Council and the Watertown Community Foundation. So it will be a free performance. It's open to everybody, families, people of all ages, um, the community members, school people. Um, we'll be we haven't started the publicity yet, but you, so you're getting a heads up on this. And we're hoping to have food that's not decided yet um, beforehand. And then there will be a question and answer afterwards um, with Sipu um, Maria Hendricks, who is the lead actress and also a member of the Pigs Gusset Initiative. So we're looking forward to that, very excited. And then um, mark your calendars. Watertown will be celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day in October, on October 1st, which is a Sunday. It's not the actual Indigenous Peoples Day. And we chose that date because the um, Newton community does a really big Indigenous Peoples Day on Indigenous Peoples Day, so we didn't want to conflict with that. And there'll be more publicity about that, but you can certainly mark your calendars. 
And we're in the early planning stages, but we're hoping to have indigenous storytellers, drummers, dancers, and lots of interesting activities for everybody. And again, that will also be free and open to the public. So we're looking forward to that and doing what we can to um, bring indigenous presence, culture, and history into the present day. Thank, so thank you. you. Thank you very much, everybody, for taking the time to to fill us all in on what our many working groups are doing. Now I want to turn actually the program over to, um, first I want to appreciate uh, Mary Skinner, who was a member of the Refugee Support Group, but also who just took this, this topic on and um, uh, just ran with it and pu put together this uh, wonderful program. <laughs> She'll go over, go over the program in detail, um, so I'm just going to introduce her. Uh, I asked her to share a little bit about herself and then she'll take the program from there. Uh, she's been with the Refugee Support Group since 2017 when she retired from teaching history and cultural studies at the SUNY Empire State College and settled here in Watertown to be closer to her two sons and their families. She's been active in civil rights uh, and women's rights and anti-war movements since the 60s. And she's a founder and board member of the Interfaith Hospitality Center in Elmira, New York. I mean, at, at the Elmira, New York Correctional Facility. <clears throat> and from time to time, she's been active in the Catholic worker hospitality houses. Uh, she's presently working on a book on lay people, including social justice efforts in the first century Christianity. Um, she convened the subcommittee of the Watertown Refugee Group two years ago to discuss what we might do to help refugee families find apartments they can afford. So I'm now turning the program over to Mary. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming tonight. This is a, such a critical issue, affordable housing. We meet it every day when we try to place refugees or we have friends who are low income and are having trouble finding a place to live among us. And so that is our issue for tonight. And we're very fortunate uh, to have Louise Enoch here as our guest. Many of you may know her because she's been a resident of Watertown for 38 years. And we're going to take the first half of the program for her to present to us uh, some information about an interfaith group that's doing great things. But first, Louise herself, she's a retired psychotherapist and has been working to establish a, a human rights commission here in Watertown. She's been working on police reform and the successful candidacy of city councilor Nicole Gardner, who can't be with us tonight, but we wish she were. Um, as a member of this Greater Boston Interfaith Organization known as the GBIO, Louise is helping to organize their housing justice campaign, and that's what she'll talk to us about this evening. And she also leads walking tours for Boston by foot and uh, facilitates, I love this one, a wise aging group. Do you have room for more members in your wise aging group, <laughs> Louise? Anyway. We'll, we'll, we'll have to start one here in Watertown. All right. So uh, please, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Carol and the others for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, I was quite surprised. I was in Hawaii where Nicole is landing today um, and it was raining, but I received a call from Mary who I didn't know uh, asking me if I would consider speaking about housing. I had no idea how she knew that I was doing some of the housing work I've been doing. And I certainly did not consider myself by any means a housing expert. And so was surprised to be asked to do this. Um, so let me be clear as I begin, I am not a housing expert. Um, but when Mary asked about the work I was, was doing and in response said that she thought I would know a lot more than many of the people who would be here this evening, I thought, okay, it's a low bar, I can do this. So I hope I do know a little bit more than some oh. of you uh, and that I can offer you some, some new information. Um, 
So I'm hoping that by sharing with you what I do know, I will help to expand the universe of people who know anything about housing issues and who might even decide to get involved working in this important area. If I were a housing expert, I would talk to you about the scope and complexity of the housing crisis that is happening across our country. I would share relevant statistics, but I think most of us who read newspapers, listen to the radio, or watch TV news know how pervasive a problem having safe and affordable housing is. What I will do, however, is ask you to take a moment or two to think about your own housing situation and notice how fortunate many of us are with regard to our housing. Also think about those you care about, those you may work with and those you otherwise hear about who are less fortunate. Let's just actually take a moment to, to think about this issue and how it may affect us personally or those that we care about. Housing insecurity can affect all ages, racial groups, many income levels, and members of marginalized communities. For the past year and a half, the organization that I work with, GBIO, the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, has been developing a housing justice campaign. I'm involved as a member of one of its faith communities, and I volunteer as a liaison between GBIO and my own congregation. Let me tell you just a bit about GBIO so that you can understand the context for this work. GBIO organizes the moral voice of the faith community to work for social change. It currently has about 61 member organizations around the Boston area and represents tens of thousands of people. And that is potentially a lot of people power. GBIO develops its agenda from listening to the concerns of its constituents, researches approaches to identifying, sorry, re, researches approaches to turning identified problems into achievable goals, determines strategies and tactics to do that, forms relationships with the people who can be held accountable for change and mobilizes its members in any number of ways to press for that agenda. So about a year and a half ago, GBIO began its own internal work for its housing justice campaign. Uh, the campaign identified four components it wanted to address. One was safe and dignified public housing. Two was more financing for affordable housing. Three was increasing the housing supply, including affordable housing. And four was developing greater accessibility for how of housing for returning citizens, people who were coming out of prison and citizens with mental health and substance abuse issues. Having defined its focus, GBIO then explored ways to achieve these goals. Here's what the campaign will be asking for from state and local officials. And let me share my screen if that works. Okay. Um, can everyone see that? But it, how do I get rid of the, um, I'm not sure how I get rid of the stuff on the left, but maybe it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter really. Okay. So let me speak about each of these uh, a little bit. So uh, in terms of the public housing situation, um, we, we know from, the stories that our members uh, who live in public housing tell about how just awful and deplorable the conditions are that they're living in. Um, as a matter of fact, when Mayor Wu was running for office, we had an action that we call an action with her, asking her if, when she, if and when she was elected um, mayor, would she pledge $50 million to repair the um, 
um, one of the housing projects in JP. And she, in fact, did say she would do that. And then when she got elected, that was one of her first acts. The Mildred C. Haley uh, housing project got $50 million for repair. So that's an example of um, holding people accountable and also of how urgent some of these public housing situations are. It turns out that um, public housing, and there are 43,000 units of public housing across the state, those are state public houses, um, they have been ignored by the legislature and the governors for decades. And so they're really in bad condition. Um, so in order to address that, um, GBIO will be working with other groups to, um, to do the following. One is um, we are asking the legislature in its, every five years there's a bond bill that is, that is written. So in the new bond bill, we're asking for eight and a half billion dollars uh, to address the backlog of maintenance, repair, and modernization that needs to be done in the housing stock of public housing in the state. It's eight and a half billion dollars. The second part of what um, GBIO is asking is that the state in its 2024 budget allocate $100. $84 million for this next year for ongoing maintenance um, of, of the housing stock. Um, so this will be an effort where we're working to get the state legislators, legislators to, to, uh, to do this. In addition, uh, GBIO will be organizing tenants that live in um, some of these places to come out and work with GBIO to um, to press for change. Um, so that's the public housing picture. Uh, in I'm gonna skip a little bit here to the um, affordable housing and home ownership. So there's a bill uh, in the legislature that was brought out last year, but not acted upon. And supposedly it will be this, this session, which is called the real estate transfer fee. And this is a bill that would allow municipalities to um, uh, have a, a transfer fee that would be, um, uh, I'm sorry, it would be a small fee on real estate sales over a certain transaction amount. So for example, $2 million, there'd be a one and a half to 2% transaction fee. Uh, and those proceeds would go into that particular community's affordable housing trust fund. Um, and this could be used to build new affordable housing or repair uh, and preserve uh, older affordable housing. This bill has a couple of good, well, many good aspects to it. Uh, one is that it would allow uh, local municipalities to have some control over uh, raising money in their own town for these efforts. Uh, it also is um, a way to discourage speculation in that um, there's a provision that houses that are bought, uh, done over and sold again within a year for many times the price of the original purchase, there would be a larger uh, fee that would be required from, from the owner to, um, to pay. So that would discourage, hopefully, that kind of speculation. So GBIO will be working to have this bill passed. Uh, in terms of generally the uh, housing supply, um, you may know that in 2021, the Massachusetts legislature passed the MBTA Community Zoning Act. And that is intended to um, address the 175 communities in central and eastern mass that are served by the MBTA's subway and commuter rail systems. So that the, each town would have to create a new zoning district in which multifamily housing would be permitted near transit stations. Um, so this went into effect and 
these 175 communities were required by the end of January that just passed to um, uh, submit a, a plan for uh, a general plan for this new district that they would be uh, looking at. And then in the following year, the year that we're in, the, the towns are supposed to be um, looking into in greater detail what these what these plans would be. Um, so Watertown did comply the end of January and um, it should be working on its more com complex, uh, comprehensive plan uh, during this next year. So this rezoning will allow more housing to be built in general. It will allow, and some of that will be required to be affordable housing. It will also be um, good in that um, there'll be hopefully less need for cars because people will be near transportation. Um, and in communities which are um, mostly single family homes, uh, this will um, mean that there'll be more housing available in those towns, the, which will bring in hopefully more diversity and more income variation. Of course, these kinds of plans are being uh, often resisted by different communities that don't want to open up their, their towns to more housing. So GBIO here will be uh, working with local groups to um, make sure that residents are involved in looking into the plans that their communities are making and that those plans will include um, affordable housing. Um, and so this is an opportunity if there were people in Watertown who wanted to get involved in kind of working with our city council and our planning to, to look into this, this plan. The last part of the GBIO plan is to provide access to uh, quality housing for returning citizens. And here, um, there are two bills that will be um, worked on. Um, one is to provide housing uh, for returning citizens in state funded programs and allocates emergency section eight vouchers for returning citizens. The other bill um, is, is very significant in that most, I mean, all returning citizens have to have, they have to have IDs in order to get housing, to get jobs, to get driver's license. And they're, they're not, uh, they don't have them, they're not available to them. And this is uh, something that the cooperation of several of the uh, state agencies could easily do to guarantee a state ID for all people who are released. And so this is a bill to, to do that. Uh, so those are the four areas that GBIO will be working on. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I want to mention that tomorrow GBIO will be having the public kickoff to this housing justice campaign on the steps of the State House at 10 a.m. We hope to have hundreds of our members show up. There will be live music, speakers, and the press. It will be fun and inspiring, and you're all invited. Even though you are not necessarily GBIO members, anybody who wants to support this work is welcome to come and show up. Um, I also want to talk for a few minutes about what I learned from speaking to Larry Field, who's one of our senior planners in the Watertown Department of Community Development and Planning. Yes. Larry generously uh, offered to meet with me and my husband, Alan Epstein, who is on this call who might wave, but he's, there he is, okay. Um, um, Alan is on the strategy team of GBIO, which is like their board of directors. So he's very involved with this as well. So Larry met with us and we felt that we, we sort of had our own private, uh, was, could someone um, mute themselves? Okay. Um, we had a wonderful hour with him in which we learned so much. We felt like it was our, our own private course uh, in Housing 101. So I think many of the things he talked about are, are relevant for, for all of us here to know about. Um, I 
I think I got all this straight. And if I didn't, please mention it when you, uh, after I speak. Um, so a main issue in Watertown is the creation and preservation of affordable housing, as we know, uh, as it is in many municipalities. Um, the kind of affordable housing we have is called deed restricted. So that means for 30 years, it has to um, stay affordable uh, with the income qualification, meaning that a particular unit um, must be kept affordable for 30 years. And the definition of affordable, which to me was very surprising, we, we all use that term, but most of us don't know what it means. Uh, the definition has to do with the what's called the AMI, the area median income in a particular geographical area. And uh, it's established by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So for example, in 2022, the AMI in the Boston Cambridge area was $140,000. And if I'm understanding this correctly, that means that uh, this, is, this is how it's decided. There's an 80% affordability rate. So the 80% of $140,000 might qualify the proposed occupant for approval of the unit. Uh, and there are other tiers of affordability. There's the 60% level. At the 30% level, again, of this AMI, people are seen as at risk for homelessness and they qualify for public housing. So that's how that's um, defined. Um, and he said there's a great need in Watertown for units that are below the 60% level. Uh, Watertown has been meeting the crisis for market rate housing. We've been doing a lot of building as we all can see uh, and Watertown continues to need to do that. Um, the location of new housing is important. Larry said it should be near transportation and services. It should be walkable and so that that coincides with the uh, MBTA plans. Uh, for a very hard challenge in Watertown is the availability and accessibility of housing for seniors. So that uh, applies to many of us. Uh, five, in the inclusionary zoning, uh, I didn't know what that term meant, but what it means is uh, that, and that's been used for the past 20 plus years. Um, this means that any new development that's built must include affordable units and those are offered without public subsidy. So in other words, the developer has to somehow subsidize those units. And sometimes that's done by, I suppose, raising the rate on the other units. Um, so for example, Repton Place on Pleasant Street has to have 10% of its units at the 80% uh, of AMI. So 10, 10 unit, 10, I'm sorry, 10% 10 of the units have to be affordable at the 80% level and 5% of their units are affordable at the 60% level. I'm sorry, but um, you're getting close to the 20 minutes. Yes, I'm almost finished. Okay. Um, there are other routes to creating affordable housing which are publicly funded. That is not through the private developers. Things like a linkage, a commercial linkage fee, which I think Watertown is um, signing on to, or the proposed transfer fee that I talked about. The, the monies from those fees go into the Affordable Housing Trust, which is an entity created for the municipality by the state. Uh, and then its funds can be matched with federal and or state funding, funding CPA money, tax credits, loans, um, in order to build publicly funded affordable housing. Uh, I'm also planning to meet with Michael Lara, who's the director of the Ward 10 Housing Authority. Uh, he's already been working with GBO through his organization called NARO, the Neighborhood Association for Housing and uh, Rehabilitation Officials, Officers to push, he's pushing for the bond bill and the 2024 budget for the public housing. Um, so that, that ends what I, what I have learned and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you.
Okay, I'm gonna take it from, uh, thank you, Louise. And uh, while we have uh, 10 minutes or so for questions, first, we wanna thank you for the excellent presentation. And I thought I saw someone's hand up already. Nancy Hammett wants to start with the question. I just wanted to comment that uh, when GBO got started many, many years ago, our church community was um, involved and it was very much focused at the time on finding affordable housing. Um, so I'm delighted to hear that they're on, on it still. And I was just gonna ask the question to all of us about who in Watertown um, it might be a lead community or advocacy group to pursue this it's i mean it's it's not my issue i know very little about it but i think it's incredibly important and there is so much happening right now that it feels urgent that well, let, me, uh, let me just quickly so we we don't uh, uh, mary was uh, has organized this so that following uh, louise and his question she will talk about some issues around refugee uh, finding uh, for, uh, housing for refugees then I will speak a little bit about what's happening in Watertown and at the council. Perfect. Okay. And then, um, Ra, uh, Josh uh, will speak Thank about you. the beginning of yet a new group, we hope, um, that might be established. Four, two, seven, uh, working on excellent. Six, six, Thank you, Louise. Four, two, seven, so I don't, uh, please uh, raise your hand. That's all you have to do is raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, the, uh, for Louise about the legislation that uh, the interfaith group will be supporting or any of anything at all, please let's have a few questions. I don't see anybody's hand immediately. I, I will ask one to kick us off a little bit. Louise, who, are, who is the sponsor of the transfer fee legislation? Do you know what the legislators are getting behind this? Uh, I don't. I don't know specifically. Alan, do you know? I can find out. I don't know offhand. Okay. All right. I, you know, I, I know. know. Uh, who's that? I can... It's Caroline. Babe. Okay, Caroline, why don't you answer the question then? Uh, well, there's, sev there's several um, transfer fee bills out there on the, on the, um, um, the, side of the house side um i know that holmes has one that or i'm um, dylan fernandez sorry dylan fernandez has one that um is it limits it to to million dollar plus houses and then mike Connolly has one that limits it to million dollar plus houses but with um with a caveat for places um, where there where there aren't very many million dollar homes, so so that's the the house side. Um, so I do know that part, uh, and I can tell you about the Senate side. I'm sorry, I do have that information. So it's it's Senate Bill 868, and it's sponsored by Senator Joanne Comerford. Um, and the the house the House Bill is 1377, which, as Caroline said, is Representative Mike Connolly. Um, that was those were the numbers for last year's session. I don't know if they have the same numbers uh, each year, but that that's who's sponsoring it. Mike Connolly's bill this year is uh, House two seven four seven. They just renumbered all the I new see. bills. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I have a question. Did okay. anybody learn anything they didn't know before? <laughs> Raise your hand, please. <laughs> okay, a little bit of learning. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Yes, Jennifer. Jen, was that a hand, Jennifer? I, I was just raising my hand to say oh. that yes, I learned something. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. You're right. welcome. All right, anybody else with a question for Louise? Um, so Louise, can you talk a little bit about, you say that the, one of the things they're doing is working with local community groups. Uh, and now we may, uh, again, when Josh talks, we'll see about whether we may have a local community group, but do you have some um, uh, examples of where else they're working and what other cities they're working? Well, 
so I think this is just getting off the ground. So I can't speak to, uh, you know, something that's really solid at this point. But um, in Brookline, for example, there's a very active um, group of GBIO members who come from different uh, churches or synagogues uh, who are trying to work together with whatever organizations in Brookline have already been working on, on housing issues. So they're, they're coming together in, in some way or another. Um, if in fact there's a group here in, in Watertown and if there are some GBIO members uh, that live in Watertown, which there are, uh, I don't know that they're committed to working on housing issues, but conceivably uh, those folks could work together um, and there might be some um, mentoring by the GBIO organizers uh, in some way or some training on how to do some of this stuff, but it's all pretty new. Alan. Um, just to piggyback on what you said, um, the actually 57 congregations, mosques, synagogues, churches, labor organizations, and other community organizations um, each do their own local work there are groups, uh, say in Newton, that's, that are working on housing. So there are local groups all over the place, but GBIO is in a what we call a quartet of public housing advocates. And this includes uh, CHAPA, the Citizens Housing and Planning Association, the Mass Union of Public Tenants, and as Louis said before, the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials, Mass NARO. So we are in cahoots with some of these other high-powered organizations. If there are churches, synagogues, mosques, in or other community groups in Watertown that want to be part of GBIO in a broader sense, um, we're always looking for new members, and uh, we can talk. We have a hand up. I'm, I'm going to do my best at how to pronounce your first name. Is it Morella? Mireille, very close. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes. So, um, and at the beginning, thank you, Louise, for this good presentation. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know. And at the beginning, you asked us to think about our housing situation. Uh, a lot of us are indeed very fortunate uh, to have our condition and live in a town that we love. Um, I guess what I was wondering was, what are we doing to maybe make it easier for Water Town to retain people? I know more than one family that as they expand or need more space, feel pretty much pushed out of the town, whether it's, you know, your family is expanding, you want to move from a condo to having a little bit of a yard, or if you're having more kids or someone to move to a single family housing, for example. I wonder whether there are any group or anyone considering that. How do we keep the some of the residents that would like to stay, but feel pushed out once they need more space? Thank you. Well, I think the space issue and the and the affordability are issues that are that may be uh, pushing people out, as you say. And and so all of the groups that are working on housing, and hopefully there will be more people in groups in Watertown. Um, this these are the kinds of things that people are thinking about. Okay, Jackie Van Loon. Jackie, you have a question. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I was wondering, um, you know, aside from the legislative side of things, which is really impressive how um, your organization is working on that, if there are locally um, things we should be targeting um, that would improve the situation, the way even like in all the four areas, but just your, I think it seems like your focus has been legislative. Is that right? Well, it's legislative, but um, there's an opportunity to try to work with the tenants of public housing to, to help them to um, be involved with these efforts. Right. And, and as I also said, um, with the, com uh, the MBTA Community Zoning Act, I think there's place for local residents to get involved in Watertown around that. And we're going to be hearing from Josh, who may have some things to say about okay. that. Great, thank you. That's right. I forgot about the thank you. Okay, we're all waiting for Josh at the end. 
Yeah, that, that was my raised hand. Is that I'm going to speak to this more in a little bit. So uh, eager, eager to have more folks who are interested in working on housing at the local level, and that's the group that we're trying to organize. So uh, okay. if, if you need any more enticement to stick around until the end, uh, there, there you go. All right. Thank you, Josh. All right. Well, thank you, Louise, and thank you for everyone for the questions. I think uh, um, we turn the next uh, portion over to Mary, who, uh, as again, we want to thank her for pulling this event uh, event together. And Mary's, go ahead, Mary. It's up all yours now. I am very pleased so far. Thank you so much, Louise, for such a great presentation. <laughs> we got a lot of information over and very, uh, very comprehensively and quickly. And uh, thank you all again for coming. Uh, mine's a little more theoretical. I kind of represent or I'm part of this uh, Watertown Refugee Support Group that spun off and became its own subgroup because of our concern for affordable housing. There's about six or eight of us, and we've been talking from time to time of what it might be possible to do. In a certain sense, in the second half of this program, uh, there are three of us speaking, and maybe it's because I'm an historian, or maybe it's because of that interest that Tony spoke of that I have in the Catholic worker movement, which is all for personalism, not for what the government can do, but what people themselves can do. I, uh, Our group, in a sense, our ideas represent Watertown's past um, in that we are asking, can we open up to new tenants apartments in already existing private housing? We go around Watertown or any of the communities near here, and we see ma many large single family homes with only one or two people still living in them. And it, it seems that uh, somehow we should be able to get apartments in what we already have. Uh, when I put this scheme before you, and, and, and then Tony's going to pick it up, and if I talked about Watertown past and what we can do with our past, he will speak about Watertown present. Uh, and update us on the pending legislation in the city that will create new affordable units. And finally, Josh kind of represents the future wave, citizen groups that are going to be keeping the focus on this intractable problem because it isn't something that's going to go away very quickly. And uh, who, because we need more places for refugees and I think I know this, as does anyone on the refugee support group, because of the people who come to us and they cannot find an apartment. Uh, there's one lady now living in a basement with her daughter. It's not a very good place, but at least it only costs her about $1,300. The idea of moving up, even though she has a profession and she's working as just a single parent uh, to something that costs $1,800 or $2,000, just seems out of the question. Well, anyway, we find, need to find new places for refugees. And uh, I keep saying refugees because I come from the refugee support group, but it's equally a problem, as we all know, for low income and especially minority families who can't find a home in our city. So how can we convince owners to rent their available space below market price? Many would say no way. <laughs> However, faith-based and interfaith groups like the GBIO that we just heard about and Louise just presented to us, as well as our own organization, Watertown Citizens, good civic groups, they offer avenues for reaching out to many, many, what did we hear? Thousands of people through the GBIO, uh, reaching out to find uh, people who are of goodwill and who are willing to offer to do what they can to help and some of them have big houses. In our refugee support group subgroup, uh, we discuss five steps we might take to open up private homes to more affordable housing. And I'm just going to present these quickly and then we can talk about it. The first thing would be to form a network of property owners who are willing to create apartments for refugees and low-income families. Now, Monday evening, three of us from our subgroup happened to be on uh, a Zoom session uh, that gave me hope that there are people out there that would respond. 
Philip de Gahi of Catholic Charities, which is a resettlement organization, a refugee resettlement organization, which has the power to find groups like us and then to bring the refugees that we can help. Anyway, he was speaking about this new program. I'm sure you've heard of it, the Welcome Program, in which privately sponsored Ukrainians and other countries as well can come here for two years and they'll come with immediate work permits. And so although people are asked to sponsor them and to take care of them if need be, he was explaining that it's unlikely that you would have to, uh, but they would have private backup support. Now this program was sponsored by ARCS and that's the refugee support group in Arlington, Cambridge and Somerville that we work rather closely with because we have similar uh, problems in, in, in similar programs. Anyway, they've been trying to find host families for asylum seekers for a stay of three months to a year. And they're now considering because they have many host families that want to do this, extending their range by bringing in new families to the US through the welcome program. Two of the ARC's host families spoke that evening of the wonderful experiences of having refugees in their home for a year. And in this welcome program, uh, Philip Degatti explained, the federal government is not mandating a particular kind of housing. He was appealing for mother-in-law apartments, the finished basements with kitchenettes and baths, those wings of an upstairs, uh, of the upstairs where children have no longer are no longer staying. Some of these spaces are temporarily donated in the program he was talking about, and uh, they are not rented. And the refugees are just our guests in someone's home. So many of these restrictions we would encounter in trying to get people to renovate their houses and put an apartment into it and then provide them, uh, they were avoid are avoided. Uh, in the welcome program, Catholic Charities matches hosts with refugees' families of uh, a size they can accommodate. And there's no reason we might well recruit homeowners who would be willing to rent below market price to refugees or low income families, partly because of the advantages it would provide to them. Now, if I had a large home in Watertown, which I do not, <laughs> I might well be interested in having a tenant family willing to shovel the sidewalks and do other chores that I in my 80s am no longer easy to do. It would be lovely to have a family in my home and to see their children growing up. The rent I would raise would surely be useful for paying the ever increasing taxes. Such an apartment could be rented at market price at, price at a later time if it need be. It would be a good investment converting space that I no longer need. So I think we may, if we reach out, find as they find host families, we would find rental families, families that would be willing to rent part of their house. So uh, we find them, but then there are other problems. So number two, we'll need to change the zoning regulations. So low income units can be easily created to rent within existing, mostly single family housing. Even if people are willing to do it, it's very complicated and not easy to pull off. And three, there'd be necessary renovations involved. But we might be able to recommend reliable local contractors who'd be willing to give something of a break to owners creating apartments for this purpose. As we in the refugee support group spoke of these possibilities, a local union promised us two bro pro bono carpenters for such projects and a vocational school raised the possibility of student interns. So the renovations piece. And then on uh, to number four, if we were to convince owners to build apartments for reasonable rental to refugees, we would want to protect these landlords from too much responsibility for new Americans like that come with a lot of problems and a lot of needs. When Mr. Degatti was talking about how the welcome program would work, he explained that Catholic charities would form a circle of concern to help each new family 
uh, to negotiate things like schools, jobs, transportation, and signing up for government programs. I was surprised that the people in the welcome program would be eligible for a great deal. Uh, but immediately the ARCS members, the other refugee group that was on this call, they immediately protested, we already do all that. And so do we. That's what we do in the Watertown Refugee Support Group. We respond as best we can to whatever needs the family bring to us. We can't meet them all. Some are very, very expensive, but we do try. And I think we'd be willing to extend our help to these new families as well, if we had new families in this other situation. So number five. Thus, if we can find owners willing to make necessary renovations to rent at lower rates to refugees, if we can tackle zoning restrictions that might prohibit this, and if we can meet the other needs of these new Americans might have in settling in like furnishings and ESL, which we already do, uh, what else would we need to do? We certainly would have accomplished a lot in the private sector. As a last measure, we might develop a private affordable housing trust fund that could loan money or perhaps give money to such families for first and last month's rent and security deposits, always a big hurdle when you're moving into new, a new apartment. And then uh, my son, he might be on this call somewhere, uh, is a real estate agent and he was trying to provide a list of places for one woman, woman I spoke of that we're working with, so she could, could move because she's going to be evicted, in fact. And uh, he also pointed out to me that if you did it through the regular real estate business, there would be another fee that would have to be paid. He'd waive it, but to whatever real estate agent showed the, part, the apartment. So it's very expensive just to move. So I think it's some kind of trust fund, if we could do it, would be helpful. Well, these are the ideas we've been discussing in this subcommittee of the Refugee Support Group on affordable housing. And I hope we will soon maybe put some of them into action, but we can't do it alone. We need a few more people to help us out and uh, we need your help. And so if you'd like to join us, please get on the Refugee Support Group mailing list. I'm not quite sure how you do that, but I'm sure we can find out. And we'll invite you to our still occasional meetings as we figure out the best way to begin. And so thank you for listening tonight. And uh, I'll now pass the baton on to Tony Palumba for the Watertown present presentation. Tony, you know well, but I just will say again that he's been active in Watertown Citizens since 1994. And many of those years have been on the steering committee. He's an at-large city councilor serving his seventh two-year term and is chair of the Committee on Human Services that includes affordable housing. Tony, your turn. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, leave myself like this just with my name because my Zoom is not working that well. First, I want to thank Mary for a really uh, amazing presentation. Going through those five uh, uh, possible things that need to be done uh, in order to help folks who are in need of housing. It's really, really creative thinking, and um, thank you for, for presenting that. I'm going to speak fairly quickly about what's happening in Watertown. Uh, Louise mentioned a little bit of it, and I'll just kind of give you a little bit of factual information and then um, take a look at what might be happening in the future here. Uh, well, in, at the council uh, level. Um, just as you know, we mentioned public housing. Watertown has uh, uh, about 500, not about, but has 589 uh, units of public housing. Uh, and as Louise said, these are for folks who uh, pay 30% of their income towards the, the rent. It also has uh, a 260 housing vouchers that they uh, they offer to to people who qualify. Um, uh, we uh, as um, we have mostly developed our housing in Watertown. Not every single unit, uh, because there are two developments that were uh, completely affordable that were uh, developed by um, one by what was used to be called Watertown uh, Community Housing. Uh, association, but then became uh, Metro West 
uh, community development, co uh, co community collaborative development. Um, that is our CDC. Uh, every area has a, uh, a CDC, a, uh, and our CDC is Metro West. But we have 1,233 um, deed-restricted units um, that are on the state subsidized housing inventory. Most of those units, the 1,233 units, most of those units came through what Louise mentioned is inclusionary zoning. That is where people, uh, where uh, commercial developers develop rent residents, uh, resident housing and have to uh, set aside a certain percentage of the units they're building for that are affordable. And um, as you might have noticed, I, I don't, I, uh, you might see, or you'll see in this chat, Elodia Thomas put in the information about our uh, affordable, our, our inclusionary zoning where, and I think Louise mentioned this too, 10% of them have to be for folks, 80% of the area median income and 5% for people who are uh, below the 60% medium income. So uh, that is, that's how our housing has been done. That's primarily how our housing has been done. <laughs> when I came on the council, it was 10%. We raised it to 12 and a half, and we now are at 15%. Uh, but that's the primary way that, include, that our affordable housing has been created here in Watertown. Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, the, some of the, I want to direct you and I don't have the link right now, but, um, we used to have for a long time, for a very long time, most of our housing, uh, was done by not created, but was managed by the Watertown housing partnership. Uh, the partnership was charged with the, um, uh, cha challenge of preserving and creating affordable housing. Um, it has been in existence, it was in existence for quite a long time. And it um, did such things as work with developers to make sure that the units that are in the inclusionary zoning were not just put in one part of the of a development, but were scattered around the development. Um, and uh, they also administered some funds, if a developer decided that they didn't want to do the units, they could also pay into a, a fee, pay a fee, and uh, the Watertown Housing Partnership was responsible for using that funds to, in whatever way possible, to increase housing. Uh, they never uh, were able to um, uh, actually build housing. Uh, there's a lot of difficult challenges in building housing, but the two big challenges are uh, the land, the cost of land, and the cost of construction. Um, but they, they, they did advocate strongly for housing. Um, and what they had done just before, uh, just recently in 2020, they created a new Watertown housing plan. Uh, the housing plan for the, at that point, we were still a town, the town of Watertown. You can find that plan if you go on our website and you go to the uh, community development and planning uh, organ uh, department, you will see a, 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 a tab for the housing for housing uh, issues. And you can uh, click on that and then you will find the complete plan. Uh, but that plan has actually been, as I said, was being re redeveloped uh, for a five year plan. It was drafted in 2020 and eventually passed in 2021. Um, I thought it would be just helpful if I just give you a very, if I just read the, the goals of this plan, not the actual strategies, uh, because you could find the strategies uh, in the plan. And the strategies are, are developed to, are, are uh, categorized, I should say, between, um, uh, ongoing, which is right, which is uh, the timeline for them are ongoing. And then they had a short term, which was two to uh, five, uh, two to four years and long, or I saw it was medium term, 
and then long term, which was three to five years. But I think it's uh, helpful just to, to, to hear what the, the goals are for this plan. Uh, and this is the plan that's going to um, guide Watertown for the next five, year, uh, five years. So the first goal was to increase affordable housing opportunities for low income households. That's less than 80% of the uh, area median income. The second goal was to increase affordable housing uh, to create more units for those that what they call deeper affordability. And that is that 60% um, of AMI. The third goal was to increase affordable and supportive housing opportunities for seniors and individuals with disabilities. The fourth goal is to encourage the creation of a variety of housing type uh, types at different housing at different price points, with particular emphasis on providing options for residents and workers. This is known as um, worker housing uh, who wish to remain in Watertown. Um, and then the fifth goal was to preserve existing affordability, as you, as Louise said, uh, our uh, deed restrictions for 30 years. So we have what happens when those 30 years are up. And then to increase community engagement around housing was the sixth and final uh, goal. So you take a look at those goals and under each of the goals are a variety of strategies that the plan lays out for the next five years. Now, one of the things that has happened in 2022, which is so important, and um, we mentioned this briefly, was that Watertown decided uh, to establish a Watertown Affordable Housing Trust. Now, this is, uh, so when that happened, um, we uh, laid to rest the, the Watertown Housing Partnership and created and established the Watertown Affordable I'm sorry, I cut it affordable, it's not the word. It's the Municipal Housing Trust, Watertown Municipal Housing Trust. Uh, and uh, three members of the, uh, that's a six person board, uh, which includes uh, uh, the city manager uh, and three of, actually it's a seven person board because he's, uh, he's a member of it and then six residents. Three of the, this is relatively new. This started in 2022. I think they've had four meetings so far and they're just getting their feet wet. Uh, 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 and, uh, but they have the same uh, challenges and they have the same charge as the partnership, that is to create affordable housing. Um, and the trust, uh, which is, as I say, three members of the, uh, the six members of the community, uh, three of them were formerly members of the housing partnership and then three new people. It was, it is, let me just uh, say, it's a wonderful group. Uh, I know that uh, our city manager had a tough time picking from the people who applied to be on the trust. Uh, these are very talented people who know affordable housing from all aspects, from the construction to the management, I mean, construct from the financing, construction and management of affordable housing. Uh, the trust is important because it may, when should we have one, and now that we have one, they are eligible for grants and loans and tax credits, something that wasn't possible so, uh, through the partnership. Um, so this is a big step forward for Watertown to have a trust. And um, so that's one of the things that, that uh, happened in 2022 through the council. Um, the other thing that is so important, uh, because as I mentioned, one of the needs is um, uh, one of the barriers um, is funding. How do you, uh, even if it is city land, how do you uh, raise the money to uh, construct an affordable housing? Um, and so we were able to, after quite a bit of back and forth, uh, establish a linkage fee. Uh, and this is a fee that is placed on <clears throat> any commercial development. It's a fee per square foot on any commercial development over 30,000 square feet. Uh, and so this, this allows us to, and I'll just take an example, the Watertown uh, Mall, 
that project there is going to be turned into another life science complex. Uh, now that mall uh, can, will, however, I forget the total footage, square footage, but it's quite large. The developers will have to pay a certain fee per square foot. And that fee goes directly into the Affordable Housing Trust. We were able to establish a linkage because first we had to uh, uh, have what is known as a nexus study, which would show that the development in Watertown, particularly the life science development, had a direct impact on affordable housing. And that nexus study was done. And it said that, yes, there was a, uh, an impact and there was a recommended fee of $11.12 per square foot. It ranged from nine something to 11. Um, our next step was to get the state legislature, well, to write the, to the uh, uh, home rule petition and get that through the legislature. So in order for us to establish a linkage free, we had to get permission of the Massachusetts state legislature. And that uh, took a little bit of work and thank goodness, thankful for our uh, state rep, uh, uh, to our two state reps and our state senator, Will Brownsberger, uh, John Lawn and Steve Owens worked very hard for us to get that through. Once that got through, then we were able to establish uh, the fee. And right now, the, uh, since it's a zoning amendment, it went to the planning board uh, they approved, uh, the, approved it, uh, and now it's going to go eventually in the next, I don't know, hopefully pretty soon to the city council uh, for passage. Um, once it, as soon as it got through to the planning board, that means any, any commercial development from here on in that is not permitted will be affected by this uh, linkage fee, and it'll become a large source of funding for affordable housing. I just want to try to go back real quick um, and say um, that the planning board kept the uh, original uh, proposal of 11.12 uh, 11 cents. Um, they did uh, suggest, they couldn't make a change on it, but they could make suggestions to the town council, city council. They did suggest that the payments be st staggered over five years. The way it's written now is the payment as soon as the, let's say it's 140,000 square feet times 11.12 cents, that has to be paid up front by the developer. Um, and uh, uh, their, their recommendation was that they, do, they stagger that over five years to develop, give the, a little breathing room to the developer. I also should say we would be only the fourth city in Massachusetts uh, to have a linkage fee. The other, um, Cambridge, Boston, and uh, uh, Somerville are the other three communities that have a linkage fee. You can imagine what it would have been like if we were able to have a linkage fee three or four years ago as we exploded in all the life science developments. But we at least have it now. And so any future life science or any future commercial, whether it's life science or not, will be uh, will be affected and will fund will help fund the trust. Uh, I want to put a I mentioned this to people and I put it on my update. I am advocating for a fifteen dollar fee. The way the home rule petition was written, um, we could go up to eighteen dollars a square foot. Uh, I'm suggesting that we should go at least at 15 uh, and go beyond what the, the city is recommending, the administration, which is the 11.12. I think $15 a square foot, I mean, $15 a foot uh, is a, is a, a, a good uh, amount, uh, a good uh, target. And um, I am support, I am pushing folks to contact their counselors to off to support a $15 fee. Um, and finally, I don't want to go any too, too long here. We already heard about the MBTA um, Commuter Zoning Act, and that is we, the council has uh, passed the first phase of that. It was, as, um, as was mentioned, that it had to be in by January.
But the second phase is to figure out where we're going to put this, where it is. And I'm pretty clear that I think that that's going to be around Watertown Square. That's going to be the um, the the actual um, area. However, we do have to pass another zoning amendment uh, in order for to make that happen. Uh, and finally, just to mention uh, uh, one of the things that that's in the plan, in the housing production plan, um, which uh, Mary spoke to it a little bit about this, and uh, in, in my the 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 zoning amendment that would have to be passed by the planning board and then again by the city council um, is known as accessory dwelling units. These are units that are built inside a home that are and, and can be available for rent. Uh, uh, and accessory dwelling units, this has been bouncing around for quite a while. Uh, and uh, but we haven't we haven't gotten an actual uh, zoning amendment in front of the planning board or in front of the council. Now, I, that doesn't mean that is in the plan and the housing plan. That's one of the strategies that they suggest. Now, my, and I apologize for not knowing this, um, but it could be written in any way, but usually it's not a very large uh, unit within the, the housing. So we have to make sure that um, we think about writing this zoning amendment in such a way uh, that would make it possible for families uh, or for small families or for one or two, three people to, to live. Um, so we have to keep that in mind and, and uh, for, for the suggestion of Mary. But that's what is, it's called, uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, and it needs, we, it is in the plan. It's one of the possibilities that could happen. In the uh, in the near future, uh, so that's pretty much what's happening. As I say, in terms of actual things in front of the council, will come the linkage fee. Again, I advocate for fifteen dollars instead of the eleven point twelve, uh, and then the MBTA Community uh, Community Zoning Act. We will have to have a zoning amendment to put that in place, um, and then uh, hopefully. Uh, the administration will uh, come forward with an ADU, Accessory Dwelling Unit Ordinance, uh, which would then be debated and discussed. Uh, and I think that sort of rounds out. I, I want to just say, uh, and I'm not trying to blow my own horn here, uh, because I'm going to give a lot of credit to uh, uh, Carolyn Bays and, and Susan Falkoff, but many of these ideas uh, have been bouncing around for a while. But four years ago, we ran uh, a series of uh, community, well, a series of hearings or uh, through the top meetings of the, through the Committee on Human Services. And many of these ideas from the linkage fee to ADUs to, to the trust were discussed. And in some ways, I think we didn't, we're not taking responsibility or for getting them through or anything, but I am taking a, a, a motive, a point of appreciation to Carolyn and to, to Susan, because I think we planted the seeds when we did these two years of community meetings, of public uh, committee meetings, excuse me, not community, public meetings on affordable housing. Um, it's almost 830. We turn it over to uh, Josh. Okay. Yes, I'll introduce Josh, if I may. And thank you very much, Tony. That was a lot to take in, but I'm so glad to hear about those accessory, what are they again? Accessory- Dwelling units. Dwelling units, thank you. Um, now we're gonna hear from Josh Rosemarin. He's lived in Watertown since 2018. And for more than a decade, he's worked in national politics to elect progressive candidates to office. And he currently advises political donors on how best to maximize their impact, the impact of their contributions to campaigns to protect American democracy. He helped to run Nicole Garden City Council campaign in 2021, and he serves on the steering committee of Progressive Watertown. Josh. 
Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you uh, for organizing the evening too. This has really been awesome uh, to hear and to be a part of. Uh, and thank you to Louise and to Tony um, as well for their great remarks. So um, as Mary was saying, my name is Josh Rosemary, and I'll try to keep it quick. I know it's kind of late, but I, I grew up in the Boston area. I've lived in Watertown since 2018, um, and my wife and my eight-month-old daughter and I are proud residents of the East End. Um, and as Mary mentioned, you know, I advise progressive donors on how to spend money to maximize their impact in national politics and their day job. Um, but in my free time, I really try to do a lot of work on local politics. I worked on the Coal Gardeners campaign and on steering committee for Progressive Watertown. And I'm excited to talk a little bit tonight about a housing advocacy group that we're starting in Watertown. Uh, doing this alongside Dan Pritchard, whom some of you may know, uh, Sam Gillardy, and Amy Plotnick, who's also my wife. Um, we're in the very early stages of this work, but we wanted to share some of our motivations and some of our early plans, because as I think has been really clear uh, in the discussion tonight, this is a really urgent issue. It's a really important issue and it affects everybody. Um, so the Boston area in general and Watertown in particular are in really high demand. Um, and the problem is that our housing supply isn't growing fast enough to keep pace. Um, you know, take Econ 101, you know, high demand and limited supply, if there's not enough uh, available housing, it drives costs up and it changes who can afford to live here. Um, so there's a helpful note in the comprehensive plan talking about how US Census, it defines a household as cost burdened if they're spending over 30% of their gross income on housing in Watertown, more than two in 10 homeowners and more than four in 10 renters are cost burdened. So this is a really serious issue across the city and it affects everyone in town. Um, young families can't afford to buy a home and settle down, middle-class and service workers um, can't afford to live close to their jobs and older residents can't easily downsize and age in place. And this is a housing crisis that's already changing the face of Watertown, it's making us less socioeconomically and racially diverse, less vibrant and a less inclusive community. Um, the housing crisis reaches well beyond the simple question of who can afford to live here though. It affects health when residents have spend a higher share of their income on housing, it leaves less to spend on food and medicine, other essential needs, it affects climate. Greater housing volume requires greater density, which allows for more walking and biking and fewer car trips. Uh, it affects small businesses, growing the number of people who can afford to live here, increases the customer base for the businesses and restaurants that make Watertown uh, such a special place to live. And so what is the solution? In our view, right, we go back to this Econ 101 lesson. The answer is simply, you, su you increase supply. Um, this means building more housing, full stop. Um, we want to see as much affordable housing built in town as possible. And like Tony was talking about, the Affordable Housing Trust is this incredible new resource. Uh, Watertown is now kind of equipped to unlock state and federal funding to support the development of housing that's more accessible to folks who are making below the region's median income. But we also need to do work to support the development of market rate housing. This is kind of more standard housing. And there's a really well-established link between an increased supply of market rate housing and costs coming down overall for simple supply and demand reasons. Um, so we want to see more housing built, and that's a really kind of key orientation of this group. Um, but beyond su supporting the development of new housing, um, we also want to get creative with zoning laws. So things like allowing homeowners to build these accessory dwelling units, these kind of smaller homes or turning basements into homes um, to allow for additional um, folks to live there or to be able to even age in place. Also things like, frankly, removing parking minimums when uh, residents have access to good walking, biking, or transit options. Um, and so we're forming a housing advocacy group with a handful of other Watertown residents because we believe that through focused strategic organizing and advocacy work, we can accelerate the development of the city's housing stock, uh, we can make the city more affordable, and we can maintain the diversity and the vibrancy that Watertown has really long stood out for. Um, we're in the really early stages of forming this group. We don't even have a name yet, uh, but uh, we are working on a few of the issues that have been named tonight, things like the linkage fee. Uh, we want to make sure that developers are paying fair share into the Affordable Housing Trust. We think this is an incredible opportunity to accelerate the growth of affordable housing in town. And so 
We're excited about that. Things like the, the MBTA communities law that Louise was uh, talking about earlier, making sure, and the attorney was well, making sure that um, we're able to upzone in the areas, make the zoning changes that uh, increase density. And we're thinking it's probably gonna be Watertown Square, but making sure that it's uh, done with an eye toward building as much housing as possible. So th those are specific issues, but we also kind of more broadly want to be a pro-housing voice in, in planning board meetings and city council meetings and in community meetings where, just to be really blunt, the overwhelming sentiment is often against new housing being built. Um, existing residents are often vocally resistant to changes in their neighborhood. Um, and this is in part, uh, one, of the, one of the kind of disparities here is that the people who are ultimately going to benefit from the new housing that's going to get built are rarely represented. Uh, because they don't necessarily know that they're going to be the ones who are benefiting from it. And so we want to speak to them. We want to speak on behalf of the folks who um, will ultimately benefit from this housing. And we believe more broadly that activism at the local level is a really high leverage way to address the housing crisis. And so we think that having a group that can respond to whatever issues might come up fills a gap that we see in Watertown's organizing and advocacy landscape. And I'm honestly really kind of heartened to, to hear the number of folks who are already saying, hey, we need something like this on this call and other conversations we've been having. Um, we we want to be a home for this because we think there's we think there's a gap and we think there's a need. Um, so to conclude, I wouldn't be a good organizer if I didn't have a couple asks. One is just to join us. Um, we're in the early days of our group and having committed volunteers who are interested in making a difference is going to go a really long way toward growing our impact. So I'll throw my email address in the chat, shoot me an email, we'll get in touch. Um, and the other ask is to think about the intersection of housing, uh, the goals of, of Watertown citizens and future organizing efforts of your own. Like I was saying earlier, water, uh, housing really affects so many of the issues that Watertown citizens cares about. And I really hope that there are gonna be opportunities for alliance and collaboration in the months and years to come. And so finding ways that we can work together, I think is gonna be really important. So I know it's late. Um, I appreciate you all sticking around, but really excited about the work. And thanks again for having me. Well, thank you, Josh. Um, again, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Luis. We are, you know, we had 35 people on this call. There's 31 here. So we can take a few minutes for questions. Uh, if we've been able to hold you for 31 minutes, uh, I mean, for hold you for an hour and a half, I think we can afford. Um, so if anybody had a few more minutes, anybody have any questions for Mary uh, or myself or Josh, please let's let's uh, let's see what we have here. If if not, that's fine. But I do want to say that we we don't need to rush off the call. Um, are there any any questions? Uh, and Josh did put his email address in the chat. So if you're interested in getting on. I, I just want to say um, how exciting I excited I am about this potential. And um, there's a lot of groups in Watertown to, to do different things. Obviously, I'm very committed to Watertown citizens, but we have never had a housing advocacy group, a citizens group, not a, a public, not an organization. We've had a great Watertown um, a housing association here, but uh, that turned into the Metro West. But uh, we never had a citizens group. So this is really exciting that there's some uh, uh, formation that's going to happen um, that there really could be a voice, as, as Josh said, uh, at council meetings, at planning boards. And uh, so uh, it's just it's just wonderful. Are there any other any questions for anybody? That... OK, all right. Well, then there isn't. Um, uh, thank you all. It's amazing that there's so many of you who, who uh, joined us and so many of you stayed with us right to the end. Uh, thank you again um, uh, to uh, Mary for her wisdom in putting this program together, uh, Louise for her presentation, and, and uh, uh, Mary for hers, and, and uh, Josh, thank you. I, I hope you get a lot of responses um, to, the, to the call for volunteers. Uh, I can already see that there's a couple of people who are ready to do it. So um, good luck. And is that a Todd? Oh, those are clapping hands. Okay. I thought that was someone looking to raise a message. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Um, thank Just you, Tony.
Thanks, Tony. And everyone. Oh. Everyone. Yeah. yeah. You give people a chance to get into the chat. There's some emails in there. Um, okay. Yeah, I won't close the meeting. Okay. There's also a question of how do you get onto the refugee support group list? Um, I'm the admin for the list, so I've put my email in there. You can just email me directly and ask to be added to the group. Okay. Thank you, Pam. And I want to congratulate Josh on bringing in his talk at almost exactly seven minutes. That was very impressive. 